You are about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. This episode is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Become a patron today at patreon.com forward slash into the portal. Throughout European history, there has always been a great number of legends and myths surrounding strange encounters with horrible beasts of the four-legged variety. Entities typically described as hellhounds have long been in the canon of lore associated with the British Isles. Strange reports, sightings, and encounters with creatures that can only be described as something existing between worlds. Creatures that, by all accounts, should not exist, especially where they are seen. In church cemeteries and along roadways and riverbanks, priests, villagers, and travelers alike have come upon or been hunted by massive, emaciated canine apparitions stalking the countryside, with tales that speak of them wreaking devastation on livestock and the human inhabitants of rural villages. Reports of such attacks have been discovered in writings dating back hundreds of years, with noteworthy monsters like the Black Shook and others surfacing out of the scorched woodwork. But what exactly could such creatures actually be? And where do they come from? Otherworldly realms? Conjured by ancient witchcraft, perhaps? Whatever it is, encounters continue to this day of hellhounds and the Black Shook. Hello, and welcome back into the portal. I'm Amber Ray. And I'm Andrew McKay. And we're back with another week. Uh, how are all we doing out here? What's up, everybody? Yeah, it's uh, kind of been some strange times as of late. And before we jumped right into things, we did want to just kind of like address what's going on. Um, we didn't want to get too bogged down in what's happening across the US and the world right now. But we definitely felt sitting down before recording today that it was important to definitely acknowledge what's happening and that it's long overdue Hmm. and um, well yeah we honestly debated uh just putting this episode off for a week and just letting other voices be heard for sure we considered it but we decided that for all of our listeners and and just you know to to keep keep some sense of normalcy i guess maybe to a certain degree uh, yeah we decided to go forward with this one Um, we did i mean yeah we're obviously absolutely just you know, sickened by what happened to George Floyd and so many other people, you know, Breonna Mm. Taylor and and so many others, um, you know, dealing with this ongoing struggle with racism, uh, something we're certainly not exempt from here in Canada at all as well. Um, So yeah, we just wanted to say off the top here um, from us here at Into the Portal that we're fully behind the support, uh, the protests, the uh, supporters of this movement and the fight for social justice, you know, for African Americans and black people around the world who have been, you know, the victims of systemic racism. So our friends at the network, uh, Straight Up Strange, have been really, really good for posting links for places where you can donate to help uh, social justice causes. So if you haven't already, uh, look for the link in the show notes below here when you're done listening to the episode, and uh, you can um, find something to help uh, support social justice causes so we can make changes for a better Mm -hmm. world. On a lighter note, we have actually amassed the new ITP collectibles that have been lost in the mail for about a month now. <laughs> yeah. So we have a new keychain and some original new stickers that we are going to be posting. And 
we're going to be giving those away to all of our patrons. Yeah. So, yeah, look look out for some snail mail action coming your way in, in the <laughs> next, uh, what would you recommend? Probably about four to nine months. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully not quite that long. We actually, you know, what? we've had some letters reach people relatively quickly. I've got my fingers crossed here. People will get their, uh, it's weird. Their Patreon swag relatively fast. Well, I've noticed. Yeah, exactly that. There seems to be some inconsistencies in the delivery, but hopefully Indeed. they do make their way sooner than later. And we did want to address, uh, we've had a lot of supporters that have been with us for quite some time now. It's amazing. Like even like two years. And uh, we just wanted to say, like, you know, it, it's kind of one of those things, like, when we moved, we totally forgot about literally, you know, like, updating all of our info across all boards. And I feel like Patreon would be one of those ones that kind of gets left in the dust. So if you've had your living arrangement change and your mailing address change in the last however long, uh, we would really appreciate it if you'd go on and update that for us. And then, yeah, because uh, we want to hook you guys up. So, mm-hmm, yeah. Because we have had that happen in the past, hey? There's been... <laughs> <laughs> some erroneous addresses or old addresses or that type of thing and anyways yeah. it would be fun just to mail some random people some stuff i guess but <laughs> just get some some monster stickers in the mail and you weren't expecting yeah. it i guess Generally, that's kind of cool yeah we want them to go where they're supposed to go though so <laughs> totally yeah so yeah stay tuned for that patrons and if you guys haven't looked at our patreon page hop over we've got the link in the show notes below and you guys can see what we do over there and yeah it's pretty cool mm-hmm. okay all right so today we are talking about Kind of a phenomena that like you were joking before we started recording sort of manifested itself in our world because this wasn't really on our radar to to do as an episode until relatively recently. Mm -hmm. But today we're talking about a phenomena that happens across the globe. But today we're focusing specifically on the British Isles and we're dealing with apparitions of the four-legged variety. Massive, disheveled, bizarre-looking, dog-like apparitions that definitely should not exist, especially with where they are seen amongst the British Isles. And, you know, we've already done an episode on the uh, alien big cats in Australia. And there's so many more cases of alien big cats, you know, black panthers and pumas and things like that in the UK as well. But instead of focusing on the felines, we wanted to really take a look at some of the sort of lesser known canine enigmas that get conflated with each other, the ABCs and these sort of like legendary creatures like the black shook which is one we are going to focus quite heavily on today. So not dogmen, not the half-human hybrids that we have discussed in the past, but rather creatures that are in many ways just as strange. Mm -hmm. So spectral hounds that are said to be darker than the night sky and that are often described as having burning red glowing eyes. Mm -hmm. Um, So what exactly these things are, we're going to try to break down today. It sounds pretty demonic, I should say, when you say it right off the bat. And It's funny you bring up the felines because they are closely paralleled when you come across this kind of topic on the internet, especially, and the idea that it's kind of strange, actually, when you're talking about phantom dogs, a lot of people juxtapose that with the phantom felines saying that these dogs are actually way more plausible versus the cats. Right. Because of strictly, like, I guess, uh, the demarcations in, like, uh, territory for, like, large cats I guess versus so. dogs like we don't really have anything other than like say wolves that are like their natural wild counterpart sure so it's kind of funny hey it's like this like it could be a very mundane thing except for the fact that they are supposedly ghosts they're spectral and also just you know gigantic in some cases and all, like the size of the eyes True. and all these different things that make them seem yeah like you said on some they're on one paranormal. hand paranormal on the other hand they manifest physically They do. Of course, like you already mentioned, Andrew, these cases, they do span quite a large amount of history, so much so that it's hard to pin down the exact origins. But of course, a lot of people will be familiar with things like the famous Sherlock Holmes novel, The Hound of Baskerville. So that, again, that helps solidify it in the English canon, in popular culture, especially in the early 1900s. And yeah. A lot of people do point to this as like kind of like the main impetus for a lot of these legends. But I would kind of argue something different. I would Mm -hmm. say that there is a lot of a lot more to it than just a simple novel adaption of something that was a a, a, a way off in the ether kind of. Oh, hell yeah. Because there's so many localized examples of this. eh? So many. 
tons. Mm -hmm. And it's it's kind of a shame to kind of like going back to what I said before. It's funny, like Carl Shooker, who's a cryptozoologist, written many books. We've referenced him before, but he said it best. Like he wrote a, an article talking about these canine enigmas and how they they just don't get the same attention as the ABC counterparts, even though in a lot of ways, like you said, like they can be almost more believable, I guess, in a sense, rather than seeing a, a Black Panther uh, in mm -hmm. the UK. Even though if you're dealing with an apparition, an apparition is an apparition. It's kind of, it's it's all paranormal, whether it's a feline or a canine. Mm -hmm. But he, he said it really well. He's like, you know, they don't really get the respect they deserve in terms of like paranormal investigation as the ABCs. But yeah, there's tons and tons of cases. Like we, we're going to list a few here, but like from, you know, the legendary Black Shook of East Anglia to the Hound of Math Doog. That's my schoolish mm -hmm. accent there. You know, uh, these things appear everywhere mm -hmm. and the descriptions do vary. But in general, this is kind of what we're dealing with here. Essentially, what people are seeing are massive jet black dogs or hellhounds, as some like to refer to them. They're often gaunt in appearance despite their size, yet they seem to exhibit like, you know, great strength and power in their movements. Like they attack things violently. So think... You, I think you added this in here, kind of like the serious black dog from mm. Harry Potter, like kind of that sort of a look, That's right? That's exactly where J.K. Rowling took inspiration from, is the all black these shook. black shook legends. Yeah. Totally. And of course, their eyes are this deep, burning, flaming red, which is directly uh, associated with obviously like Christianity, hell, demonic things and sort of that nature. So we're mm -hmm. going to get into all of that. There's even occasionally descriptions of yellow eyes and sometimes even cyclops, mm. uh, uh, cyclopic heads, a singular flaming eye on these creatures, which is very bizarre. That's as well. bizarre. I wonder if that could be just um, misidentification because they're glowing eyes. Maybe they think it's it's just like a general emanating red. It sort thing. of appears as one. I could mm -hmm. I could see that because the descriptions overall are said to be nocturnal, essentially, right? Which is why people are getting these glowing red eyes. And we know, mm -hmm. I mean, people who have been seeing any animal in the dark, like their eyes will shine at you. Exactly. They don't shine red necessarily. They shine yellowish um, green. But I mean, obviously people are seeing something that wasn't just the typical, oh, there's a, a deer off in the woods type thing. No, much beyond that. And just to touch again, like, yeah, we say Sirius Black and kind of like conflate him with uh, the Black Shook. But I would honestly say that Sirius Black is almost the alternate version of these spectral dogs where it's like beyond just the physical description, you do get examples of these dogs being guides or helpers or, um, you, you know, they're, they're not always malevolent. Certainly, and yeah. so that in my mind, I think more of a serious black is like, you know, he's always Harry's guide, right? Throughout right. until he dies. And I think he plays more of that type of role versus the the black shook, which is like this very demonic, very destructive, like you come across this thing and it's fatal kind of thing. So there are variations in that. And that, again, ties into these sort of murky origins of the phenomena. Yeah, totally. Many articles kind of, you know, they just go about the more mundane um, explanation saying this is basically the result of thousands of years of human interactions uh, with wolves and and tying into mythology uh, this goes far back beyond uh, the domestication of dogs yeah. so you have to think of the more wild side of it <laughs> again like you already said we're not we're not talking about dog-headed men we're talking about dog like beasts so a little bit of a, it's kind of funny. I kind of thought about it when we started doing the research for this. I was like, oh, are people going to think we're jumping back into like a part five of our dog man? Right. <laughs> I know, right? But no, no, definitely not. So that being said, uh, people for centuries in the UK have encountered and witnessed these horrifying enigmas that cannot be chalked up to a simple amalgamation of various candid concepts and stories across millennia, yeah. we would say. These span religions, all sorts of cultural contexts, and of course, these localized examples, which when you start to get into even like, you know, like the more later on and like, say, like post Renaissance, like newspaper clippings and things like that and things that Charles Fort kind of pieced together in his research, it becomes a lot more of a mystery in my mind. It doesn't just tie up with the simple killing of a dog and that's that. No, no. It's got such a more, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, not just substance to it, but like more... Oh man, like meat on the bone is there what I'm is trying to say. Like bone. that, like I guess that's substance too. But it's just more. It, it and just there's feels inconsistencies, more real. right? Totally. And you have to look at those newspaper clippings in particular and just wonder what's left off the page. No kidding. Reading between the lines, right? If you know what I mean. Or and even the people that just didn't 
report things that they maybe encountered. I mean, think about, I mean, we're, we haven't mm-hmm. got into the sightings yet, but some of these were really early and people could be as potentially associated with like things like witchcraft or seen as insane mm-hmm. or whatever. That's true. So it's like, man, if you like, start to suggest these types of things then you might get lumped into the same sort of category, which was dangerous back in those days. Yeah. <laughs> Even we do have one example where a uh, correspondent of one particular uh, publication kind of voiced those opinions. But again, the story was quashed after the killing of a dog. Apparently. Yeah. yeah. So it's a mix of horrors, everything from massacred livestock to people being stalked and attacked um, during the day, in the night, mostly, though, I would say. These are mostly nocturnal encounters. They're, yeah, I, get, I, I think of Skinwalker Ranch a little bit, too, right? The, the, one of the first encounters with that family with that gigantic wolf that was, like, as big as a car. Yes. So that's kind of what I'm picturing in my head when I'm thinking of, like, a Black Shook-like character. I'm glad you mentioned that, too, because that, that will come back. So you've mm-hmm. jogged my memory a little bit. Yeah. And again, Skinwalker, think all sorts of weird, right? This has all sorts of weird. Like some of these victims, like some of the slayings of these sheep, it was like kind of like Chupacabra-esque or something like that, where it's like they were just found drained of blood. These were just sport killings. They weren't, uh, they weren't for sustenance. Exactly. That's the big kicker here is that it wasn't for just like, you know, just to survive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And obviously the big question that comes up with something like that when we're asking ourselves, are we trying to find a cryptozoological phenomena that's extremely aggressive, like going back to like our Beast of Jevadon type episode? Or is this, yeah, like something from from another another place? And the fact that it's sport killing, as you put it, rather than consuming anything is like, is this supposed to be an omen for the people finding these drain bought, you know, you know, cows and sheep and things drained of blood, a harbinger of doom for the place that this is happening? Or mm-hmm. is it just, you know, like, yeah, like a random cryptozoological angry animal, you know what I, I mean? Like it's like, yeah. Or I'll just throw out the other idea here that Keel would be a proponent of the ec- ultra terrestrials. So these are people, these are shapeshifters. They can kind of like morph and shift into whatever they need to be yes. it definitely ties into the idea of like cattle mutilations uh bloodletting and these sort of weird experiments that and and like scenes of the killings right that just don't make sense where it's like where did all the blood go it's just not there <laughs> so, so we're getting bizarre. into all sorts of weird stuff today no kidding because obviously you said chupacabra well we had details of a proboscis with that uh, creature, which would have it, which mm-hmm. explained the draining of the blood. And, yep. and with this, we don't. And it's and, exactly and, all we have is like the testimony of uh, local investigators, including police, that basically said this couldn't be the work of a dog. <laughs> there were there were exact uh, citations and examples that were quotes saying that. So Freaky very stuff. very weird. Definitely has some parallels to the chupacabra in that sense. Eh? No doubt. Mm-hmm. Beyond the straight up draining of blood, Amber alluded to obviously just a, you know, the violent nature of some of these very early reports. Mm -hmm. And even so much as like you look this thing in the eye and it can like kill you. (laughs) Yeah. Like in like, like, yeah, like you just like boil from the inside, like you just die, like just all kinds of horrible things would Mm -hmm. happen. Or you just go insane. Or you just go insane. Not, not very pleasant either. Uh, you said earlier we can go back really far and kind of draw uh, draw lines to things from the ancient past, you know, three-headed dogs in Greek mythology and all these kinds of things. But it got really, really real in the UK in the first millennium AD, uh, or CE rather. So around 1127 CE uh, in the British Isles is when we get our first really significant report, I'd say, of uh, what many refer to as the Black Shook now. They think this is the first instance of that creature. So... This is pretty freaky. It occurred at Peterborough Abbey, and it is recorded in the Peterborough Chronicle, which is just uh, an an amalgamation of reports from that area and made by, like, the... uh, What would they have been? Monks or... Abbots. Abbots, I guess. Same Mm -hmm. idea. You're all wearing robes. So, but research has been done more uh, recently by a guy by the name of Dr. Simon Sherwood. He's from Northampton University, and he uncovered a text that spoke of a black dog sighting Uh, in an Anglo-Saxon chronicle that we just mentioned. And this is how it reads. Let no one be surprised at the truth of what we are about to relate. For it was common knowledge throughout the whole country that immediately after the arrival of Abbot Henry Poteau at Abbey of Peterborough, it was the Sunday when they sing exurge choir, 
Many men both saw and heard a great number of huntsmen hunting. The huntsmen were huge and hideous and rode on black horses and on black he goats and their hounds were jet black with eyes like saucers and horrible. This was seen in the very deep part of the town of Peterborough and in all the woods that stretch from that same town to Stamford. And in the night, the monks heard the sounding their horns. Reliable witnesses who kept watch in the night declared that there might well have been as many as 20 or 30 of them sounding their horns. This was seen and heard from the time of his arrival all through Lent and right up to Easter. End quote. So that's obviously just soaked in religious context. Yep. And obviously viewed directly through the lens of like monks and abbots or whoever is, you know, living at this place. So they're, they're, they're basically describing to me demonic entities riding through with their hellhounds, essentially. Uh, that, that's how I read it. The huntsmen, like as if they're there to like. Well, yeah, totally. I hear you. And I'm questioning the arrival of this specific abbot. Henry of Poitou or whatever. Like, why are these things following him? Because they arrived immediately after he did. Right. And they stayed all the way up to Easter, which is weird, right? Because obviously Lent is the month of giving something up. So you give up something up until the end and then whatever. <laughs> That's my very, like, on kosher We Catholic. are not biblical scholars. No, yeah. no. I just like, yeah, like you said, this is very much steeped in religious connotations because of the mention of Easter and the specific abbot. What are, What is your thoughts, though? Like, we don't have a death. We don't have any attacks on sheep. We have multiple hounds. We don't have one hound, which, again, Black Shook has been synonymous with both. You get singular, you get multiple or plural entity. Yeah, it, it, I, I don't see this as being the first instance of the Black Shook. What is so bizarre about this to me is the fact that there's human accompaniment. And this comes up again later because well, because there's obviously so many of these encounters where it's just a, a spectral hound or, or a giant black dog. Mm-hmm. But then there's these instances where there's multiples and this this is almost everything all at once. We're kind of starting off with A, one of the earliest sightings and also B, a sighting, an encounter that has kind of everything. So it's also, so it's giant, strangely jet black dogs, but they're accompanied by like cloaked, strange ominous figures so they're accompanied by humanoid entities controlling the hounds essentially Mm -hmm. Um, but none of these entities are responsible for killing anything or maiming anything i mean not from just this quote we've read obviously we do get that later on Mm -hmm. and the question is whether or not it's the same entities or if it's related in any way Hmm. i almost read this as like the abbot himself is somehow tied to demonic energy and the fact that he decided to come here this energy follows him so i don't know maybe he did something bad maybe <gasps> maybe he wasn't participating in lent maybe <laughs> or that was he it. had actually seen these things before and the whole harbinger of doom aspect is very true and sort of maybe he was followed along by this because that's that's something that comes oh, up I time see. and time again you see this and something bad happens and no matter where you go so, but we never had any follow up. Exactly. I mean, it is eleven twenty seven. You don't have Poirot on the case, you no, know, you know. <laughs> jotting down his notes and uh, doing a big speech at the end. Yeah, where's uh, Jessica Fletcher when you need her? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's kind of what I make of that. I mean, it's kind of a nice way to ease into this story, I suppose, of these strange dogs, because it's it's got everything. But there's yeah. way more specific stories. Yes. You don't sound I, too uh, no, keen no. on that. I'm kind of like. I'm not going to harsh on this story too much, but so I don't know. We don't get much on the description of these hounds, too. We get jet black. We do get eyes like saucers and horrible. What horrible is just like super generic. What do you mean by that? Like they're horrible as in like they're just like gaunt and mangy and all that. Or they're yeah, horrible I mean. as in they're ripping each other apart. Or like, you know what I mean? And we don't get the example of like the glowing eyes. Right. Which for me is key when you're thinking about a demonic dog but i feel like these are demonic riders yeah definitely, i feel like these are definitely, definitely the riders. tied in to all of it and the hounds like everyone thinks of the hounds as the accompaniment right it's like it's it, it the hell hounds come to to ride you into hell kind of thing right so they're kind of right. like the assistants if you think about it so maybe it does make sense that they're accompanied by these uh these riders that are even more terrifying so they just add to the whole show <laughs> no i totally agree and the, i'm y- you using the word show 
kind of makes sense because, you know, straight folklorists don't buy any of this at all. They mm. see it as the same thing we've mentioned time and time again in the Bunyip episode and Yaoi, all these things where it's uh, very much a cautionary tale put forth yeah. by the abbots, the abbey, I see. Um, where it's potentially, you know, people believe that these early stories, you know, you know, keep keeping children out of dangerous places, you know, beware of going into the woods, be, beware of going out at night, beware of approaching strange people you don't know, I guess, <laughs> or, mm-hmm. or, or animals that you're unfamiliar with. The one thing I know they didn't include the red eyes, the eyes like saucers to me is even weirder than the color. Having, having eyes that mm-hmm. are gigantic Huge uh, eyes, yeah. is like taking in more than any other normal creature would. It's like it sees through your soul or something. Mm. It's like more than just the world around it is what I, it's like, it's like, oh, you know what I mean? Like, it, yeah, so I kind I, of get what you're, yeah. You know what they kind of remind me of now? I'm going to Harry Potter again. It reminds me of the, uh, those winged horse-like things that were invisible to most, except for people that have seen death. And they were the ones that, um, pull the carriages along to get yes. to the Hogwarts. It kind of reminds me of that because they have these huge, horrible eyes, right? Yeah. But they're not dog-like, really. They're more horse-like than anything. Exactly. But they're skeleton, skeletal to a certain degree as well. So mangy, emaciated, you get that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. That's a cool... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. For When I first read it, I actually misread it. And I thought they were ascribing the, the saucer eyes to the horses, which made sense to me. But I was like, oh, well, if it's applied to dogs, that's a totally different thing. Very Freaky, true. man. Aside from all the kind of like ambiguity surrounding this, like it definitely kind of stands alone as like the most early possible example you can pull from. In the UK. That we've, yeah, that we've come across at least too. If anyone else has any earlier stories, that'd be really cool. Send them our way. Yeah. Shout out to Charles uh, at uh, Weird Tales Radio Show over there in in the the British Isles. I'm sure he would have... uh, have something to add to the discussion as well. I'm pretty sure he's coming up with a new folklore book. Yeah. We'll soon. definitely have him on for an interview we sometime should, soon yeah. for sure. Sooner but this later. story kind of teed up, obviously, the at least the sort of like public common knowledge of these types of creatures, which would then lead to the legendary yes. Black Shook and many others as well. Exactly. The Black Shook is kind of like the centerpiece of it all. And this was concentrated around East Anglia. It's in the coastline, the countryside. It actually was derived, like the name of the beast was derived from the old English world, suka, meaning devil. So again, closely related to (laughs) the darkness. So for centuries, the inhabitants of Suffolk Coast have told tales of this large, emaciated, shaggy black dog with flaming eyes the size of saucers. (laughs) Had to include that. Of course. Uh, However, these depictions of the Black Shook did transform over time and he was sort of accounted for in some instances in different counties almost at the exact same time so it was like oh like how what what is the range of this beast and are, are there the, more than one exactly. right? or are they ultra terrestrial where they can kind of like it's almost like they can walk in and out of our dimension right and right. in that case that would account for a lot of these weird sort of circumstances 100 percent. Uh, but the first official black shook account i really like this this is really just like just an anecdotal just like a verse like one line and it says all down the church in midst of fire the hellish monster flew and passing onward to the choir he many people slew (laughs) so it's kind of like a fun little nursery rhyme for people but not really fun (laughs) man nursery all nursery rhymes back in the day were a little grim they were i think uh they were. They were Aesop's fables. They were meant to teach. Cautionary, of course. Cautionary tales, yeah. And this is a, a pretty uh, one sentence, or well, two sentences technically. You get a pretty good picture of what happened uh, mm-hmm. for this first sort of uh, encounter with the Black Shook. Yes. You ready to jump into the story? Let's do it. So Sunday, the 4th of August, 1577. So we're several hundred years now after the... Uh, encounter i would call it not an attack an intimidation i guess you might say at peterborough abbey and this was at saint mary's church in uh, suffolk england how it actually started is up for debate but essentially what happened was extremely violent attack from a massive spectral fiery-eyed hound that was said to just appear essentially out of nowhere it materialized within the church during a powerful thunderstorm, so a lightning storm, this is something extremely unique in the paranormal world that we haven't really come across a ton, uh, talking about interdimensionality, talking about 
paranormal activity in general, things like that. But the storm itself was said to be so intense that it reportedly actually killed two of the men inside the church tower uh, when a lightning bolt struck it. They were electrocuted to death. And it was right after this, the lightning strike, that the beast was said to have appeared. So lightning hits the spire, and all of a sudden this massive spectral black hound appears and violently tears into the congregation. Massive claws and fangs and rips open the people sitting in the pews. One particular version goes that right after the lightning struck the church, this devilish dog came through the front doors of the church, attacking the congregation, bounded through the doors. And there were two men who were kneeling in prayer, and they were the first to go, uh, slayed by the beast, torn apart, their necks wrung by this terrible creature. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a fun one. Well, not fun, but it was very visceral, the description. It was like basically similar to the first quote here. And all down the church, in midst of fire, the hellish monster flew. And as he flew past the two men knelt in prayer, their necks were wrung where they where they were knelt. That's how quickly it yes, moved. Yes, exactly. The power so, of this thing. Totally. Yeah, that's ominous, man. Um, it didn't stop there, though. So, allegedly, the beast continued on. It, it bounded out of St. Mary's and was seen shortly thereafter at uh, Blytheburg Church. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. This is roughly 12 miles away where it's killed and maimed more people, uh, members of a different congregation. The quote here from uh, one article was, it's immense and bone-crushing jaws, and where it said the scorch marks and the beast claws, like like you said, imprinted on the floor. So, it's as if this thing was flaming. It's, it was it was emitting more energy than just being a giant, strong. It was like beast. the epitome of hellfire. Is kind of the 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 visual I'm getting in my head. Yeah, it was really cool too. Yeah, this hellfire scorch marks on Blytheburg Church on the doors. You also get this quote here from the first instance with the two men that were killed where they knelt, and it said, "As quickly as he appeared, the dog vanished, oh, leaving man. nothing but scorch marks on the floor and two corpses in his wake." Right <laughs> now, as I giggle, <laughs> as you can. Well, I mean, it's a really old story, so it's. Mm-hmm. Um, just picturing I think that, it, man. Yeah. Um, seriously. I, and I guess the question is, okay, so the second attack, these scorch marks, so scorch marks on the floor of the first church and also scorch marks on the door of the next church. And uh, we'll have, we'll, we'll put up posts of these because you can still see them, these alleged scorch marks. And the ones particularly on the second church door are really interesting to me because they do look as if they run... Uh, vertically in streaks of what look like black scorch marks, like from a Mm -hmm. piece of metal or something. It's like three or four of them. Yeah, it's like three or four. And it does to me look as if almost like a right paw, if you will, or hand or whatever, uh, knocks the door in with with its right hand. And that's what causes the marks. Mm -hmm. It It does look like almost like scratch marks. Just a single smash against the door. Yeah. Yeah. Um. You have to wonder too, I mean, obviously the legend goes that these brief encounters would prove fatal. Like we mentioned before, even, even the bravest men, right? Even the the most deadly hunters, right? If you see this thing, it's almost like a Medusa effect. Something bad is going to happen to you. So you got to wonder that about these congregations. If you didn't have your neck wrung from this spectral hound running past you or ripping you open, what happened a couple months later to some of these folks? A couple months later, a couple days, couple days later, a couple hours, a couple I mean, yeah. hours. Because some people, it was reported that they, even just locking eyes with this beast would either just paralyze you with fear to the extent that you're unable to move, talk, even explain what happened to you. And then there are others where it seems to be the case. And even uh, I will mention uh, Charles Ford again because he has the idea that perhaps these people were stricken with other sorts of disease, right? That wasn't actually explained up until the late 1800s with Louis Pasteur with, uh, say, hydrophobia or or, uh, what's it called? Rabies, for example. Things like that. Yeah. So perhaps these people were having encounters with real creatures or maybe these are these ultra-terrestrials that can perhaps exhibit the same types of things. Which would still be real creatures, right? Just not in our... 
they just defy our principles and and sense of the laws of physics. But. Exactly. <laughs> and just for everyone's reference to uh, Charles Fort, for those of you who don't know, we have a little more details on him going forward here, but he was one of the, a very early paranormal researcher. He's a pioneer. Uh, and uh, his name is the basis of uh, Fortian research, yep. Charles Fort. So anyway. Anything, it's kind of sad because he... <laughs> He was torn apart. Like his reputation was in the crapper by the time he ended up retiring. And he obviously he's no longer with us. He was around in the early 1900s and all. He did a lot of his research. He published Low in 1931, which we'll be quoting from in this episode. And yeah, it's, it's interesting because he is kind of considered the the grandfather of uh, paranormal sort of genre in general and, and, and unexplained phenomena, things like that. And it was interesting because we've read John Keel and we actually have his Strange Creatures Through Time and Space. And in it, he does quote from Lowe. I was reading both and I was kind of going back and forth between the two of them. And then I actually got confused because they have very similar writing styles. And yeah. Keel has been accused of kind of copying or satirizing for it to a certain degree. And he has addressed that in interviews. And mm-hmm. I won't actually like, speak to that too too much but they are very similar in their ideas totally uh it's very intriguing but yeah we'll get to fort later on but you guys fortian like you know you, you guys know what I, yeah who that you could is. you could put the pieces together and figure <laughs> that one out we've what we've sort of seen so far from the things we've talked about is like man oh man churches seem to really get the brunt of these early attacks and this comes up in our theories section trying to kind of break this all down as to why and one of the reasons we will break down is this notion of obviously we've talked about things like hauntings in the past and stuff like that and the idea of places of death or you know pain suffering whatever like so church kirkyards you know nearby graveyards places maybe where someone was hung obviously this is back in the day people were getting hung outside churches and things like that this seems to be what potentially draws these creatures or energies Mm -hmm. if we believe that they are purely spectral so kind that's on the sense. side that's not cryptozoological but 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 interesting nonetheless mm-hmm. i yeah i i i would have to say yeah it's kind of funny we we're doing this and i added i was like man what's up with churches getting the brunt of this stuff <laughs> seriously right but it's not only churches uh prisons also were sites where these spectral hellhounds supposedly haunt indeed they were mm-hmm. places of more suffering and pain yeah so we've got a really fun example of that for you guys but first we're gonna have a few words from our sponsor as well as a little promo for our fellow straight up strange podcast host uh, can't make this up history podcast so let's check it out taking care of your mental health is just so important BetterHelp Counseling Service is a new way to get the help you need when you need it. And let's face it, it's not always easy to ask for help. Well, now it is. They offer secure, convenient, professional, and affordable online therapists. BetterHelp is a really easy way to get the help you need when you need it. And let's face it, those times can sneak up on you. Like in the middle of the night, when you wake up with all sorts of stressful thoughts that can cause a spiral of anxiety... Knowing you can talk and have support or just someone in your corner to go to can really curb those spirals if you're anything like me. BetterHelp has licensed professional counselors who have a broad expertise in areas that might not be available to you locally. They specialize in everything from stress, relationships, trauma, self-esteem issues, or even just sleeping issues. And what's really great is anything you share is confidential and you can begin communicating with a real person who is a licensed counselor in under 24 hours, all in the format of your choosing, whether it be desktop, mobile web, Android or iOS apps. Totally. And best of all, it's a truly affordable option. And Into the Portal listeners get 10% off your first month with discount code PORTAL, spelled P-O-R-T-A-L. So why not get started today, you guys? Go to betterhelp.com slash portal and simply fill out a questionnaire to help them better access your unique needs and get matched up with a counselor that you'll love. That's betterhelp.com slash portal. Financial assistance is available for those who qualify. So please, if you feel you could benefit from this, check it out. And again, that's discount code PORTAL, P-O-R-T-A-L, to get 10% off your first month with BetterHelp. Hi there, my name is Kevin and I host the Can't Make This Up History podcast. Before starting the Can't Make This Up History podcast, I taught college history for five years during which I learned the best history is told through amazing, unbelievable stories that actually happened. For example, 
Did you know that the Nazis believed they could use witchcraft and astrology to shape government policy? Or that in the 1800s New York City shipped its prisoners, poor and insane, to a miserable island in the East River where convicts served as orderlies for the mentally ill? Did you know that a 1920s con artist masquerading as a Native American chief was able to bilk European aristocrats out of millions and attracted beetle-sized crowds wherever he went? Or that the Franklin Expedition, lost to the Canadian Arctic in one of history's greatest unsolved mysteries for over 150 years, was finally discovered in 2014 by following Inuit oral history? The Can't Make This Up History Podcast is dedicated to telling these stories and more through interviews with a wide array of guests, from academic historians to Pulitzer Prize-winning journalists. New episodes of the Can't Make This Up History Podcast are available every other Tuesday on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. All right, so make sure you go check out uh, Can't Make This Up History. He's got some really, really cool content over there. It's, Definitely. It's a lot of stuff that we really dig on. So let's get into Newgate Prison. This was a notorious site that was well known for instances of a spectral mangy black dog. So situated near the outskirts of the city of London near St. Paul's Cathedral until at least it was torn down in 1904. Newgate was this notorious site not only for these phantom dogs that were said to appear before every public execution, but also because of the deplorable conditions of this prison. Mm -hmm. So between the years of 1783 and 1868, in total, publicly or otherwise, 1,169 people were executed at this prison. And these included men, women, and children. Yikes. So very deplorable conditions here. I actually have a quote here. Uh, it's priceless in revealing the situation of hangings at the time. So I just had to say this. Okay, so quote, the condemned man, woman, or child was led along the quote, dead man's walk beneath which their body would later be buried in quick lime and onto the scaffold. Hundreds of people turned up either to cheer or to jeer and to watch the poor wretch breathe their last. End quote. They were literally walked over the spot where their body was going to be put later on and basically just dissolved in quicklime. That's disturbing to me. Good times, yep. That's, yes. Uh, it wasn't the only place that they hung people, though. They also had a shed. But anyways, that's... Right. Uh, yeah. There were some pretty cool people that were actually imprisoned at Newgate, including uh, Defoe and... That playwright that uh, Emily Oscar watched so Wilde. Much. Oscar Wilde yeah, was there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. So going back to the black dog, uh, he actually had appeared much earlier in the prison's miserable history. So hangings were between the years that I mentioned above. However, because of these like deplorable conditions, it was, oh my gosh, it, unspeakable horrors. I can't even get into it. It's just, if you go read into the history of this place, it's it's a whole episode in itself, oh, really. Yeah. So a lot of people kind of put those two together. So the suffering of the prisoners was kind of like symbolized by this emaciated black dog that would kind of, it was almost like, it was the embodiment of their suffering. Right. And he, it was almost again, veering into that sort of like serious black sort of territory for me where it's like, he almost feels like he's like, sympathetic and benevolent to the prisoners at least and yeah. in my mind i almost think that perhaps the dog appeared on the night before the executions to kind of help the prisoners guide them to the afterlife so to speak that's it's an, it's an a, omen right that they're, is interesting they're not alone in their suffering and i think that was what that's a very powerful symbol and i feel Absolutely. like that could definitely be tied into this particular phantom canine uh since the demolition of the prison however though the canine phantom continues to be sighted. Uh, this was another quote. Slithering along the top of the wall in Amen Court, behind which once stood the prison and the deadman's walk, the apparition is always accompanied by a terrible smell of death. End quote. Hmm. So yeah, accompanied by a terrible smell of death. We have... Uh come across that uh, a couple of times and talking mm -hmm. about some hauntings and things like that. That implies to me that 
yeah, like there's a crossing over point. There's, it's almost like poltergeist like stuff, right? Mm -hmm. You're smelling something weird. Um, yeah. Things like that. The, the other the, the interesting notion too, the idea of this almost being like a, a guide for, for the, for the prisoners or the men on death row, because that kind of ties into some ancient mythology stuff, right? I mean, like even like Anubis, you know, the dog, the, the jackal headed God, uh, in Egyptian mythology, uh, mm -hmm. tied to the underworld. Um, yep. you know, uh, kind of like the gatekeeper. Exactly. And there's other instances of that too, in like Greek mythology and stuff like that. So that's kind of a curious, modern almost kind of a take you know what i mean it's almost to me it's almost as if like obviously these people wouldn't be aware whatsoever of ancient egyptian mythology or anything like no, that but it's almost yeah. as if there'd be like a modern manifestation somehow in that sense if you were to believe that there was like a a dog guide some sort of a mm. you know what i mean like a, a transitioning to the afterlife or something like that yeah i this is interesting too because i didn't actually mention the dates here so it was between 1300 and 1500 when the dog started appearing at the prison and again like i said like he kind of symbolized this perpetual misery of the prisoners themselves because they're these were just deplorable conditions right they i can't even yeah like the things that i read i was like oh my god i can't even and it obviously made marks on uh, people like daniel defoe who included it in later works uh uh, novels and such right yet despite all of these horrors and uh, these deplorable states of reality that these prisoners lived in and died in it's interesting to me because it's a juxtaposition again to cases that we've noted in the past with things where there's all these negative energies like coalescing lots of death happening like like lep castle right and the uh what was it called that like spectral thing that wasn't a human, the elemental the elemental right yeah and so this is kind of like an alternate version of that it's a it's a not an anthropomorphized version but like an animalized version of it almost right and it's not it i never saw a single instance where it was like this dog tortured or like um just scared the bejesus out of any of these prisoners right he was kind of just there as like watching over them or something yeah. was the feeling that i got from reading about it at least and that's the feeling that a lot of people did get from seeing these things. Like it wasn't always a harbinger of doom necessarily, but it makes you, it makes you think again, going back to your comparison kind of to like a skinwalker ranch where there was experiences with certain things that were extremely ominous and frightening. And there were others that were just strange. And it's like, you know, you're not necessarily dealing with the same entity. It might be coming from the same place or it might look similar, so to speak. I mean, the same goes mm -hmm. for the alien big cats. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. It's really hard to pin down, even though this has been happening yeah. for so long, like dozens and dozens of reports, even just in the 19th century in the 1800s, you know, massive black dogs, not wolves, like definitively not wolves because people knew what wolves were. There were, you know, orders put forth by early Kings of England and stuff like that to like protect villagers from wolves because that was a genuine problem. People were being eaten alive by wolves mm -hmm. and people knew the difference between, I mean, I get, I, unless dire wolves were a thing maybe <laughs> you know like actually existing at this I time wonder, yeah. uh, <laughs> but people were obviously limited in their capacity to understand what they were dealing with so like we kind of alluded to earlier the notion of witchcraft was often brought up um always viewed within the context of a christian lens obviously because you're mm -hmm people are essentially a, 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 a illiterate um, for the most part and, and they only know how to perceive the world around them because of what they're told at church and they're god fearing uh, people exactly mm -hmm. so there was one particular story in 1751 that quite a few people in and around sort of the area of east anglia believed to be connected with some of these spectral spirits and stuff like that so like there was a witch essentially like that was executed drowned you know, a woman drowned mm -hmm. for witchcraft. Oh, Not too much details on the story, but shortly after this is when some of these sightings began to begin. <laughs> began to begin. They started. <laughs> and, you know, the question was, is this a restless spirit manifesting itself to take revenge upon the villagers that drowned this woman for being a witch? Hmm. You know what I mean? That's interesting. I like, I like this association because it kind of dabbles in the whole, like, yeah, like all these witch trials and all the stuff where it's like, you say she was executed by drowning. So what was the whole like, so if you were sentenced to death by drowning, if you drowned, it proved your innocence. Right. If you got up and flew away, proved them right because you're a witch. Exactly. And then you can even take that 
further with this because perhaps the locals would have, again, translated that as like her witchcraft manifesting through the afterlife. Oh, anyway. she turned me into a newt. <laughs> yeah. I got better. Right? right? And and then that again reaffirms the the existing cultural understanding of what magic and witchcraft is. Totally. The, the whole vampiric thing that we brought up to didn't really help with with this sort of like blanketing of the the notion of witchcraft and like evil things happening either. Mm. Because Man, there was some strange stuff. I mean, you could even potentially tie this into like cattle mutilation UFO type activity if you wanted to. Certainly John Keel does. Yes, he does. Mm -hmm. He really likes to try to kind of bring everything together. He does. uh, In his works. You would imagine after so many years of research and writing and talking to people and collecting these stories that you would just, at some point, you almost like throw your hands up in the air and you're like, hey, like... I need some sort of grand unifying theory here. And this was kind of where he went. And the interdimensional hypothesis was something that was popularized in the 60s, 70s and continues to be pretty, um, pretty legit. It's either (laughs) the extraterrestrial hypothesis or the interdimensional hypothesis. Those were kind of the two competing ones, especially in Kiel's heyday. So he kind of, he, he switched gears about halfway through and he decided that interdimensional explained a lot more of the phenomena than the inter or sorry extraterrestrial the classic kind of nuts and bolts coming from a long way away type stuff yes regardless of what what you sort of um place as the origins of any of this the fact that some of these attacks were vampiric i want to come back to that because it was just Mm -hmm. absolutely bizarre and you mentioned charles fort off the top and he was the one who kind of dug a lot of this up right from the british uh, museum of london there was documents that you know, spoke about farmers and people who reported a lot of these things. And particularly the border of Scotland and England in the early 19th century was a site of like just violent rash of attacks on livestock. So, you know, killed completely unexpectedly. This wasn't like sort of like, you know, Puerto Rico, El Chupacabra, like, you know, a year later, oh, we've heard about these attacks before. Like this was brand new for these people being, these things being drained of blood. And they're essentially just nipped in the jugular, you know, uh, like you said, like very deliberate, not, not, not mm-hmm. looking for sustenance or anything like that. And farmers went crazy. They stocked their fields. There was just the massive sort of, you know, pitchfork mob type things out. Uh, and yep. reportedly there was one large dog killed. Very sad because likely it was just a local's dog. And allegedly after this, the attacks stopped mm-hmm. in this sort of early 19th century case. And this is pulled from John Keel's mm-hmm. Strange Cre- Creatures from Time and Space book. The question is whether or not it's like almost like a placebo effect. You know what I mean? Like are these people being haunted by something for whatever reason? They they kill a regular dog and they feel better about it even if Mm -hmm. the gateway is still open. It's catharsis. And yeah, Fort continues that too. And he kind of – he has a few things that I I pull quotes from uh, that I'll read a little bit later here. But yeah, no, it's definitely – this is a, another complicating factor. And Keel touches the, on this quite a bit in his book, Strange Creatures from Time and Space. He does connect this with other monsters, phantom sort of animals and things of that nature too. But like he even talks about the Beast of Gu- Guavadon and all that kind of yeah. stuff in yeah. his book too. Yeah, but, he does. But anyways, yeah, it's kind of interesting because Charles... He dedicated a large section in his book, Low, which was published in 1931, on this particular spree of strange killings and others that would follow after it. So beginning in 1810, uh, in the month of May, this was a quote from him, something appeared in Ennerdale near the border of England and Scotland and killed sheep, not devouring them, sometimes seven or eight of them in a night, but biting into the jugular vein and sucking the blood. Upon the 12th of September, someone saw a dog in a cornfield and shot it. It is said that this dog was the marauder and Mm. that with its death, the killing of sheep stopped. Right. So this pattern would repeat several times throughout this century and into the 1900s as well. And uh, first of all, Fort considers the fact that the only animal he knows that sucks blood 
is the vampire bat. Yep. This does not explain <laughs> these killings, though. Vampire bats don't even kill their victims. They just, they leave them alive because it's more convenient. So this is a huge inconsistency that is further developed by Fort. He begins considering that these stoppages, quote unquote, to the killings may only be media fabrications. It's not the real ending to what's plaguing these farmers and shepherds. Right. It's just like you said, it's a placebo. It's a cathartic sort of act. Yeah. And them even just getting their pitchforks and their guns and going out into the field makes everyone feel better. <laughs> it makes everyone feel safer, at least. Yeah. Um, in another, so he's quoting from this publication, Land and Water, which was pulled from the British archives. Land and Water was very interesting, actually. They were around in the 1800s, 1860s, I think, is when it first kind of came about. And they were originally just focused on, it was like a men's fishing magazine. It was like the outback, what are you doing in your leisure time in, in you know, nature? And then it quickly developed in uh, World War One into something that was more focused on, like, war exploits and things of that. But anyways, it, he pulls a few examples from Land and Water. And there was actually mention uh, of the nature of the killings. It, it said, it was said that the sheep had been killed in a way that led to the belief that the marauder was not a dog. <laughs> Interesting. Throat slit, blood sucked, no flesh eaten. 42 instances recorded by this land and water correspondent. It's quite a few. It's a lot. Uh Despite the correspondent's thoughts that this didn't line up with the work of a hellhound or demon dog or just a regular dog, you know what I mean? The physical evidence actually painted an even more confusing picture. Um, it was said that, quote, the footprints were like a dog's, but were long and narrow and showed traces of strong claws, end quote. Interesting. So it does point to something that is beast-like, is dog-like. Uh, the fact that the claws were evident, again, kind of uh, speaks to the a canine, right? Because they can't retract their claws. Exactly. Like a cat can. Yes. Uh, so again, he goes on. There's a few different examples. And he even goes into this 1905 example that was pulled from the Do London Daily Mail on November 1st. And it said here, the sheep slaying mystery of badminton. <laughs> 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 yes. Yeah, so again, we've got another mystery of all these dead sheep uh, between the areas of Gloucestershire and Wiltshire. Okay. I hope I'm saying that even remotely correctly, where a lot of sheep had been killed. This was where we get into the actual police sort of like commentary. So Sergeant Carter of the Gloucestershire Glu Glute Oh my gosh. <laughs> Gloucestershire police. <laughs> I'm just gonna go with that. I was kidding. Gloucestershire. <laughs> Gloucestershire. You say it like Gloucestershire. It's like Worcestershire. <laughs> Gloucestershire police is quoted saying I have seen two of the carcasses myself and can definitely say that it is impossible for it to be the work of a dog. Dogs are not vampires and do not suck the blood of a sheep and leave the flesh almost untouched, end quote. Yeah, and he's obviously correct mm -hmm. when speaking about regular known cryptozoological, like not the non-cryptozoological phenomena, like dogs of the British Isles. Dogs, uh, yeah, exactly, um, were known to exist. So again, I feel like he's trying to paint a picture here. He kind of ends this little section by saying, it's like, then, December 19th of the same year, quote, marauder shot near Hinton. It was a large black dog. Interesting. So he's kind of trying to paint a similar picture where it's like, again, it's like, is is this a pattern or is it just the fabrication of an ending that isn't really an ending? Good question. Yeah. That's, a, I mean, yeah. it's so yeah. hard to say. I mean, obviously like you mentioned that they found footprints at, in these fields that yes. pointed to a four legged canine mm -hmm. uh, of unknown origin, but there's no other footprints to say, wait a second. There's also this, you know, um, no. uh, and there wasn't actually any reported, like, witnesses saying, like, a large black dog was leaving the scene of these killings. So, again, it's kind of like... He goes on, though. He he recounts other journal articles that discuss the slaying of the sheep, terrible losses for the peasants of Limerick and Cavan, uh, shooting of multiple dogs with no depression in the predations. So, again, it's a placebo uh, he says here, even near Limerick, there was a slew of attacks, and these were on sheep as well as human victims. Bites that actually led these human victims to, quote, being taken to the Ennis Insane Asylum, laboring under strange symptoms of insanity. So there's kind of three things that pop into my head there, and you've 
listed a few here, obviously the idea, this is early on, like what is happening with rabies in this context? Yeah. Could mm-hmm. people be, I mean, but it almost seems like it's happening too quickly for that to be a thing. Werewolf type activity, you know, yep. the, the, the sort of like random killings, not consuming flesh, biting the jugular, mm-hmm. you know, finding dog prints, but that you can't seem to correlate it in any other way other than the prints, but also the idea of lycanthropy for me. Mm. Like I'm thinking like Peter Stubb type stuff. Yeah, like totally. people may be, maybe for whatever reason, and maybe this has to do with something paranormal going on too, the actual, you know, spectral dogs themselves. But, you know, like we said, it can make you go crazy. Uh, it's not just mm. a harbinger of doom. You're going to die of leprosy or something. Mm-hmm. It's like maybe maybe people are becoming like the, you know, like a Peter Stubb or something. They need to be locked up in the asylum because they've they've seen something that's making them go insane. It's yeah. not actually rabies or something, but... No. Well, speaking of insanity in particular, this is an interesting thing. And I actually, we didn't include this in the research notes here, but just a quick little story I have. When we were looking into some of the castles, I believe it was Pell Castle or Peel Castle, I was looking into, and that was the Math Dug. The, the infamous right. mouth, yes. which was this like really shaggy, like curly haired spaniel type dog is how it was described. And he basically was this phantom dog that lived in this castle. He had one specific corridor that he was said to roam, especially during the nights. And none of the guards would ever go anywhere without a buddy. It was like buddy system through and through. However, <laughs> one night, a drunken guard, drunk on the job, like, come on, he, um, he decided he was going to disregard that and he decided to do the patrol on his own. He had like keys he was bringing somewhere or something. Uh, the story goes that he he laughed off Math Dug saying, oh, if the dog follows me, then I'll be able to see for sure if it's a real dog or a demon or like a ghost or something. And then the story goes, he was in the hall and his like guard, the counterparts that were still like, you know, like in the room they heard this long, terrible sound, like a wailing scream or something like that. And when they came across the guard that had left, he supposedly was in such a state of fear that he couldn't speak, he couldn't even gesture as to what had happened. And he ended up dying of insanity. Like he couldn't even, like three days later, he was dead. And he never had time to describe what he had actually seen. Very much like the hellhole story, eh? Very much so. And again, you mentioned Lep Castle. That reminds me of the elemental, the idea of people. Mm -hmm. Wasn't there someone who almost threw themselves out of the the third story window or something? Because in that room, like where they... It was in the bell tower or something where, yeah. Or no, it was the... the the, the, the place where they would do like church ceremonies. I right. Think. I mean, yeah. And there was people, even some the modern chapel. investigators, there was stories where like they'd be up there with a camera or something. And then all of a sudden someone would come up to see how, what's going on. And they were like sitting on the window ledge, mm-hmm. like about to jump out the window. Yeah. It was and almost were like, totally unaware. There was like the feeling of suggestion to go to that yeah. and to just go off the edge. And no so, one can so, really so explain strange. where the inception of those ideas were coming from. Totally. So kind of a cool story with uh, Math Dug. Apparently yeah. that specific corridor has since been walled off. Hmm. Uh, it used to be a bed and breakfast, but apparently in 2016 they shut it down. Hmm. Hmm. Too many strange things happening, perhaps. Yes. <laughs> you know, we've been mentioning some pretty early stuff, obviously going back to 1127, I think it was I first referenced, and then some of these 19th century ones. But there's some super modern ones, too. And way too many to reference. Uh, I kind of pulled just two from sort of like a 40-year span here because they were really, really like bizarre in the sense that they tie to other paranormal phenomena that we've mentioned. The first one is from 1972 where a guy named Nigel, Nigel Lee or Lay reported seeing essentially a UFO. So a bright object fall from the sky as he was driving near Cannock Chase, England, which is just like a district And he watched this object crash in a nearby wood. And out of this bright light, a large black dog emerged and darted into the nearby woods. Now, (laughs) Hmm. UFOs connected to the black dog phenomena. Like, I mean, chucking the question out there to the listeners here, because this was something I did not expect to come across. We dabbled in uh, UFO Bigfoot related stuff in our series there. And there's definitely a correlation in some stories, but mm-hmm. this, I mean, I, I i guess the same could go for the black shook and things like that. The whole demonic thing is just, mm. a, is just a religious lens. What you're actually seeing is potentially something from getting dropped off. 
potentially. You know what I mean? And it's, yeah. and it's manifesting in a physical form that we recognize. I mean, we see it as a dog. You know what I mean? We, right? Like, I don't I, know. Like, yeah. If you, if you buy into any of that Bigfoot stuff too, like it's getting dropped off by a UFO, it's manifesting as a, a humanoid like figure that mm-hmm. we recognize, except they're not very good at it because we see it as just the Fritz Frankenstein abject. And what the heck is that? It looks like me, but it isn't me. With Bigfoot, you're yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's kind of funny. It's almost like that connection with Bigfoot and UFOs almost props this up in some weird way, just because it's like two sort of monstrous entities that supposedly you can almost go either way, right? We, we've talked about uh, Bigfoot in like more of like a spiritual interdimensional type of thing versus like a flesh and blood population living amongst us. Again, yeah, this is kind of an interesting... As soon as you weird, quoted right? that, I was like, that reminds me of uh, Flatwoods to be honest, yes. with the crash, right? Yep. Yeah, and and the idea that a creature was sighted after. <laughs> I guess if you want to go really like Joe Nichols, skeptical inquirer-esque, you could just say that it was a satellite that crashed and someone's dog just ran away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> two <laughs> unrelated. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there was a dog in the woods. He heard the crash and went skittering out of the woods because he got terrified or whatever. Yeah. That would be like my like Joe Nickel, like let's just make this... Um, as mundane as possible. hundred percent. And I didn't, like, I Googled around a bit and was like, okay, 1972, like what, what could this guy have seen? And I couldn't really come up with anything. Like there wasn't a report of like that, like you're saying, like a sat, like, you yeah. know, something crashing, but very easily could have been misinterpreted. And the same kind of goes for the next one because oh. it's like, it's sort of, it's not the same. It's not a UFO sighting or anything like that, but it's just straight eyewitness and whether or not it could be a trick of the light or whatever kind of comes into question here. It was a daytime sighting, 2009. So very, very modern. This was a a family called the Bradleys. And they were, by all accounts, from the UK, but they were out visiting some historic landmarks in their country. So they're at one particularly historic cathedral uh, in Litchfield. And basically, they were just sort of viewing the outside of this cathedral when they came upon what they could only describe as a hellhound. (laughs) So they're visiting as tourists and they basically are like walking along the edge and they see this massive black dog darting along the side. uh, They see this massive black dog darting along the side of the church. So I guess they're sort of standing at a distance and they see, they see this animal running along the side. But what really spooked them was the fact that this thing took sort of a wide loop out from running right along the side of the wall and then darted directly at the wall. So picture you're running alongside, you take a bit of a U-turn, and then it just went straight into the brick and vanished. It's like platform nine and three quarters. Exactly, exactly like that. Thank you for saying that (laughs) to get the visual of what I'm describing here, because that's exactly (laughs) what these people described and seen. Weird. They didn't like report it or anything. They just kind of came out with the story a little bit later, because like, how would you report that to? Like, yeah. Right? Um, yeah, that would be and strange. And obviously this Tell brings the up the question, where the hell do these things come from? Uh, you know, again, we've mentioned the, the, all these sites that seem to be where they manifest, churches, kirkyards, you know, uh, places where people are hanged, things like that. But then it just like, like, is this the portal? Like, is it a portal because like things have happened there and it can just go straight through the brick wall? So there's multiple churches and multiple places where they could be, they could come from essentially. That's interesting. Or what if, again, if you almost think of like, it's like a, a Venn diagram is what I'm thinking where it's like almost like the conflation of two spheres or two dimensions. And maybe this thing doesn't even see a wall. <laughs> maybe yeah, we only it, see a wall. <laughs> well, there's the, there's the whole notion of time slip phenomena too, the kind of yeah. Partridge Creek-esque mm-hmm. uh, If you guys haven't listened to that, go listen to our episode on that where it's like maybe they're witnessing an event that already happened, right? Perhaps. A, an ancient species booking it into the woods, Maybe. but the woods is now a brick wall. Maybe this, um, this family, the Bradleys, is kind of like an updated version of the Scooby-Doo gang, and they happened upon what was supposed to be a very famous and historic cathedral, but there's hidden treasure, and the, the person, <laughs> the caretaker, is trying to scare everyone away so that they can go and dig for the treasure. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's just me being stupid. But yeah, no, oh, that, that almost kind of does remind me of like the Scooby Doo, right? The trick of the oh, it's just a projector, like you know, like hundred <laughs> percent things it like totally that. Totally does give mm-hmm. off that vibe. Unlike it was the just UFO, a sheet the whole time. Yeah, oh. <laughs> unlike the UFO one, where 
I, I kind of forgot to mention this a second ago, the, the potential tie to the idea of electricity. This guy's seeing a ball of light drop and then this oh, entity yeah. manifests out of it going back to the black shook and the lightning strike at the spire and that sort of being like opening a gateway potentially mm-hmm. like could that have anything to do with that you with that first 1972 sighting that i just brought up right the idea of because like connections to electrical storms and the paranormal comes up all the time this idea that there's sort of patterns when thunderstorms and lightning storms appear there's often haunting activity uh especially I mean, ghost investigators are all over this in particular, not so much Mm -hmm. cryptozoologists, but um, thunderbirds are another sort of entity that comes that can manifest out of electrical storms and things like that. And whether or not Mm -hmm. it's just mythology of indigenous populations, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think there's something real people were seeing. Oh, I love Um, that idea of like the the clap of the thunder is the flap of a thunderbird's wings. So cool. I love that. But again, yeah, like the sightings and even what was that? poor fellow that got picked up in his yard that one time and marlon low marlon low and (laughs) yeah man i mean i guess the only thing that maybe wouldn't tie in with the idea of like lightning or an electrical storm opening a portal is like then why are they only occurring at these places we've mentioned churches kirkyards like places that Mm -hmm. we're, we're tying we're linking it to like death and like energy on one end but then there's phenomena like ball lightning and like weird things where like mm-hmm. things manifest. But how are how are they happening at the same sites? You know what I mean? Like that doesn't seem to be correlated. It's yeah. just coincidence. Almost. Lightning is a beautiful thing because it is so enigmatic and so little understood, right? So it does help almost like magnify or project the like the weirdness of it all or the mysterious nature of it all in my mind and definitely and the deadly aspect as well obviously and it's weird though because when we like let's just get into the pattern of these a little bit because yeah the lightning aspect is something that's played upon in multiple accounts not all of them it's almost it's almost like there's like this big pool of elements or uh tropes or something that you can uh, attribute to these types of circumstances or killings or creatures or whatever you want to say but they're not always there it's like the the recipe incorporates different ingredients in each case kind of thing but right so what does that mean does that mean that we're just conflating things does it mean that there is a pattern i tried to kind of like so this is kind of what i pieced together here so it's like these accounts they do follow a similar trajectory recorded throughout history so it, it always starts with um <laughs> it's kind of funny. I say it. it starts with an electrical storm. It usually starts with an electrical storm, not always. Followed then by sightings, intense violence, killing, strange circumstances within the deaths themselves, then the hunt. So the human action. Yes. Followed by the catch slash kill of a simple dog, then killing stop, quote, for a while, right. usually. So if, what do you make of this pattern? Is this something that, again, is fabricated out of convenience in the media? Is this some, Is there more to it? It's so funny to phrase it that way, like fabricated out of convenience in the media, because obviously we're dealing with stuff that's so old. Like mm-hmm. that almost sounds like such a modern phrase. Well, you know the, what I mean? Like 1500s. Yeah. Like, but the it's importance still, of the press like, was still there. Of though. course. Yeah. No, totally. <sighs> I, I think there is a pattern. I think you've got it in, 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 in obviously the right order there. And... I think it's important to note too, like I've said multiple times, obviously at churches, kirkyards, these types of places are manifest. It wasn't just that. It was along roadways, banks, uh, river, riverways and stuff like that. Places of travel and transport travel, like between trans- these yeah. places. Laneways, dark laneways. Exactly. Yeah. So on the one hand, that makes sense as like a real wolf or something stalking prey because these are high traffic areas. Any predator would do that. But also the notion of, uh, you know, ancient people, not ancient peoples, but early, uh, peoples of the British Isles saw roadways, laneways, you know, forks in the road as literal transition points, not just it's a road to get from A to B. It was a, it was like a, a representation of, a, of a, of a more spiritual transition or mm, traveling or something journey. like that. Mm-hmm. Um, That's interesting. So in that sense, there's, Ooh. there is a pattern because these things are, no matter how they appear, whether it is electrical storms every time or whatever, mm-hmm. quote unquote, they, they show up 
and they they do follow this pattern you've laid out here Mm-hmm. Uh, it's interesting you kind of focused in on the laneways and the things of that nature because we have focused mostly on churches and that prison example that I pulled up. There was another sort of like, um, I wouldn't call it the Black Shook. It was called the, oh, I'm going to totally push this, the Gwiligi Gui, Gui Gui of okay. Northeast Wales. So this was more of like a Mastiff-like dog, but again, black, shaggy, fierce, glowing red eyes, and this quote black hound of destiny was encountered by one edward jones one night as he was riding in a dark lane on horseback Ooh. it was said that the beast materialized and stalked him for quite a ways and he was so paralyzed with fear that he couldn't actually turn around to lock eyes with it and when he finally could muster up the strength and courage the beast had disappeared he, so it's almost like, yeah, he's he's on a journey and there's things that are in in his past, metaphorically speaking, right. or even physically, like, you know, like right behind you, stalking you. So like you can play with this on several different levels, I think, too. Oh, yeah. I, I actually, yeah, that's, that's a very interesting idea that it's almost you're very vulnerable when you're on a, a like, say, like a, a highway or a you know what I mean? Like a, an abandoned roadway where there's not a lot going on. You're yep. very vulnerable. So in that sense, it almost kind of brings to mind like uh, Ichabod Crane and like the whole uh, oh, yeah. the Sleepy Hollow legend of the Headless Horseman and things like that. You cross totally. the bridge, you're safe. 100%. You get to a certain checkpoint, you're safe. Yeah. And, and Beast of Javadon too. I mean, going back to that, like stalking people and same sort of idea, but the roads between their farms and things mm-hmm. like that. Is this the same creature? I mean, we actually didn't mentioned the black shook or really touched on this phenomena doing the beast of jevedon episode but mm-hmm. when we do are doing this episode beast of jevedon the wahila these types of sort of potentially potentially mythical and or real creatures came up mm-hmm. which i find to be really interesting mm-hmm. i am gonna go back track in a little bit here into the whole idea of these patterns again let's just kind of like just sew that up with a nice little bow because again charles fort had some thoughts on this pattern or the the pattern these stories or accounts as they're kind of portrayed through media and he says here quote almost anybody anyway in the past before suspiciousness against conventions had the development that it has today reading these accounts down to the final one uh, one would say why of course this is the way these stories always end up nothing to them (laughs) but it is just the way these stories always end up that has kept me busy. Because our experience with pseudo endings of mysteries or the mysterious shearing and bobbing and clipping of mysteries, I went more into this story that was said to be no longer mysterious. Hmm. The black dog that was shot by the archdeacon was sacrificed not in vain, if its story shut up the minds of the readers of Land and Water, and if it be desirable somewhere to shut up minds upon this earth, end quote. So that was what he had to say. That was page 111 of his book, Low, chapter 13. And I thought that was very intriguing because, again, right, it's this manipulation of the the, the ending, right? It's like this yeah. this was something mundane. It was a simple dog. And the fact that it was described as a dog and not a wolf in all these accounts, again, kind of speaks to this, like, oddness in my mind. Yeah, why wouldn't you just, why, why wouldn't people assume it's a wolf? That would be the you most know, convenient. It would be the most convenient. It would be the most people or understand it. Like they did in like, the Trolls. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, good point. Simple bear. No <laughs> doubt. <laughs> You know, yeah, it's funny when you think of it on that end of the spectrum where it's like, yeah, they, you know, people see a dog killed, the the, kill, the the thing stop for a little while and then it comes back again. And then the beginning end of the spectrum is trying to figure out what the origin point is of whatever for people who believe it's not just a dog. Mm-hmm. And I threw in this notion of pagan witchcraft into not even, the, we're not at theory section here really, but I couldn't really find much, um, but that kind of popped in my head. I was like, could these things be summoned? Is, is there some sort of like ancient ritual going on here? Hmm. Um, and maybe that's the reason for the bloodletting of cattle in some way, right? Yeah. Is, there, is this more ritualistic rather than just like a beast from hell that's wreaking havoc? Mm-hmm. Um, a little bit more, you know, whether it's something to do with, uh, you know, the, Dru- the ancient Druids definitely did 
sacrifices and stuff. Pagans did sacrifices. I couldn't find much, but there was one thing I did find that seems to be just a straight folkloric legend, but it is really interesting and does tie to witchcraft. It's like straight out of the movie The Witch. According to local folklore from the area of Dartmoor, there was a story from around 1000 CE about a skilled hunter named Bowerman. And this is a really strange story because the legend goes that he was out hare hunting with his pack of hunting dogs and he stumbled upon a strange place that he had never seen before. It was a cave system, but it wasn't just that. Inside one of these caves, he found a secret coven of witches, or at least so the story goes. And they were hidden deep within these previously completely unknown caves across the moorland. So it's kind of vague from here, but local lore suggests that his dogs upon seeing these witches went into a frenzy and they were spooked essentially by clearly what was going on inside these caves, some sort of a ritual. So they rushed into the cave in sort of this freak out and interrupted a ceremony that was being performed by the witches. But not just this, they also knocked over the cauldron, quote unquote, where the ceremony was being performed. So Bowerman and his dogs fled, you know, um, But the coven that they had encountered was obviously pretty ticked off. So they went into a rage and began to shapeshift. So the story goes that they changed into hares to try to trick the dogs, to try to get revenge for interrupting their ceremony. So they shapeshifted into rabbits. And they ran into the woods and caught the eye of one of the dogs, which ended up leading the whole pack after these rabbits, darting towards a nearby uh, marshy ground and a swamp where each dog and Bowerman, once they chased the rabbits onto this uh, damp land, were swallowed by the earth. But that's not all. The story continues on, where these witches hauled the drowned bodies out of the marsh and turned them to stone just for good measure. And there's a line of rocks at the peak of this place called Hound Tor that is said to be made up of these dogs, the remnants of Bowerman's hunting party. Uh at this outcrop, um, which is also named after him, called Bowerman's Nose. So at first glance, this is obviously a really creepy legend. Uh, There's no giant phantom dogs involved in it, but there is a connection because this location, Bowerman's Nose, and where these rocks are placed is actually the site of many encounters with creatures known as the Whist Hounds, which are giant spectral dogs. Uh, huge, black, deadly dogs with blazing red eyes. And very much like the Black Shook, they allegedly preyed upon travelers uh, and subsequently their souls, if you want to think hellhound here, of people going past this territory. Uh, So yeah, I mean, what do you make of that? It's almost as if the Wilst hounds are the manifestation of the drowned dogs turned to stone, I think is the sort of suggestion. I wasn't sure where the story was going to (laughs) go. I was expecting something to come out of the cauldron. (laughs) Were you now? Uh, Yeah, I was. (laughs) Like what? Like a spectral black dog (laughs) or or a pool of blood. They're cooking one From all of the the blood that we've been talking about. But (laughs) 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 Uh, on that note too, I have a point of blood, but I will save that for a sec. Um, This is weird. Like, I I guess you could almost say like, perhaps these whist towns as they're called are the, the, yeah, the demonic or not demonic per se, but just the uh, spectral apparitions of these murdered dogs. Uh, I don't think it is a just cause to murder a bunch of dogs and their owner just because he happened to knock over something that you were working on. Um, Not really justified. Which is work on a different sphere of ethical (laughs) decision-making. Yeah. (laughs) I think this is kind of cool, though, as far as like uh, these do correlate quite closely to things such as the Black Shook and other demonic dogs like the the Moth Dug. I I, I suck at saying that, but I love saying it at the same time (laughs) because of these blazing red eyes. That's interesting. You included a little note here saying that a squire was supposedly killed by these beasts. Yeah, there was a few different stories. Uh, Local squire Richard Cabell. Was he, I wonder how, like if it was uh, ringing in the neck, if it was simply the, the sight of like locking eyes with one of these things. Or I what believe happened? that he was just mauled. I think he was ripped mm. apart. I don't think it was a, a little more insidious one. Like what? Like Medusa oh, style. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. 
but yeah, I didn't, I didn't go into details on that, but That's like the cool. whist towns are just one of many, uh, like we've said, like there's so many of these spectral dogs. Yes. And it's interesting because you say hounds, plural. So obviously this is a pack of dogs. This isn't just one singular, which again, like we kind of off the top of this episode, we did kind of address that where it's like even things like the black shook have been amalgamated in terms of multiples or singular. So you can yeah. kind of go either way with that. So it's this suggestion essentially just to kind of wrap up my thought there with the, with that story the idea that there was ancient magic that's still you know running its due course mm-hmm. you know uh, that the, the, the site, exactly that the that the 1577 and and any subsequent sightings or anything like that is is a result of something yeah that that, that took place we can't quite explain necessarily mm-hmm. potentially if you if you buy into that pagan <laughs> or otherwise i mean i don't know And I always just come back to the, it's the cultural lens through which we're perceiving. Like we see through a very uh, non-religiously tinted lens ourselves. So we try and make sense of things in that framework versus someone that is part of, say, an abbey and they see things through a religious lens. They are going to explain the situation that way. And then again, pre-Christian, again, you're going to be going to those sorts of like the markers, right? Like how can we make sense of this? How do we know things? How do we know the things we know <laughs> yeah. is kind of the idea, I guess. Cool story. Um, that note I had about the blood and this is kind of, we've been circling around this for the whole episode, but I just wanted to bring it up because uh, we actually didn't have any specifics that pointed to whether or not these blood drained victims actually had any blood around them we don't have any sort of clarification on that right like skinwalker ranch there was reports where there was no blood at all it was just like it was absent yes and we've seen that another like in the chupacabra as well and i'm curious if there is it's simply draining of blood and the blood's all over the ground or if the blood is drained into some sort of bucket or some sort of vehicle to transport it like or if for it's ritualistic consumed. purposes you mean exactly yeah. exactly and even with the example of the chupacabra we had that we had the suggestion of a proboscis we also had the sort of like weird like saliva like goo on the victims i again we don't have any of those details here for you guys so it's unfortunate because a lot of these cases are so old that it just wouldn't have been included or if it had it's been lost <laughs> yeah definitely. but an interesting point to know like what do you make like what would you any, I just any don't. On that? Yeah, I, I, I don't see it as being the comparison to Chupacabra is fascinating, and you're totally right. Like the noting a strange substance similar to what's left by mosquitoes, like wouldn't have been possible. Um, no, but I'm just. Or if it was observed, it wasn't recorded. It would have just been like, oh, it's saliva from a Mm -hmm. beast much like the correspondent from land and water where they kind of insinuated their own sort of whatever but they didn't really fully flesh that out right and i feel like even in those days as a reporter it's still dangerous to suggest these types of things it is i mean i always just come back to the idea of something straight up more demonic when we're talking about there being no blood and i mean like whether it's yeah it's weird though because it's like the stories of being accompanied by humans imply that maybe there is some witchcraft involved. Like there's something having to do with like a human entity controlling the situation. Or are these like grim reaper type figures where they're not really humans themselves? <laughs> That's what I, well, yeah, whatever. Is a witch a human? I yeah. mean, it's a supernatural figure though. Christina's a witch and she's human. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm mean? talking like from the movie, the witch, like the, the creature in the woods. Mm-hmm. It's like living off the blood of an innocent child and things like that. It's like yeah. clearly an entity from beyond. Right? Am I right? <laughs> am, I, am I wrong here? I'm not sure. I don't know. Tell me if I'm wrong. Everybody listening. I, yeah, no, I, I understand where you're coming from with that. And the idea that we're talking something strictly demonic, uh, I, <sighs> It's like did the chicken or the egg come first? Where That's these exactly notions it. of demonicness uh, associated to black dogs because of the behaviors, or was it the reverse? Like you know what I mean? So they certainly look demonic. They have all those sort of typical trademarks. Like the night riders is what really solidifies the demonic aspect for me, right? The horses and the the accompaniment by humans. Mm. Yeah, the night riders in that first story. Or like we already suggested too, the fact that they are hellhounds, they are transporters to hell. Like, you know, they will guide you to the gates of hell, not to heaven. They're not going to the pretty place. You're going to the... (laughs) But I I think it's important to note though. It's like, what is that? Your pretty face going to hell. (laughs) Great show. (laughs) But it's like, like what, yeah, what is hell? I mean, 
that's just what it is viewed through the Christian lens. But it's, if these things are, it's, it's just interdimensional to me. It's like, if that's what you see this as, right. Yeah. Like a guy, you know, like when we see these spectral hounds, uh, accompanied by cloaked or hooded figures, like riding horses, sometimes in, in even a couple of accounts, they were riding the dogs from what I could see, like massive, oh, really? massive dogs being ridden by cloaked riders um whether that's just sort of some creepy pasta f- floated out onto the internet hmm. i'm sure it is in a lot of cases but it's it's the ties to the afterlife that kind of for me tie into uh demons uh dark forces hell and all that kind of thing and and you're right yeah the the, the cloaked riders and hooded riders they definitely add to that sort of portrayal i don't really have much more to say on that though it's like yeah that's definitely one way you can interpret it sure and if that's the case i guess you are if you believe that that's a thing like i just said it's extra dimensional whether it's hell or not is just based on your worldview your epistemology if you're a christian or not but yes you know know, I, i hear what you're saying so you're going towards the extra dimensional which in my mind is where we always naturally go. <laughs> and so let's talk about shapeshifters, ultra terrestrials, uh, these unnatural styles of these attacks uh, leading to the culprit being this ordinary dog. This doesn't add up. And so in my mind, I'm thinking shapeshifters, not actual dogs taking the appearance of such though. And okay. this was kind of funny. Like Charles Ford had a little, little ditty on this. He says, if these things that may not be dogs be... <laughs> Their disappearances are as mysterious as their appearances. Agreed. Which kind of tie into Keel's ideas on the uh, IDH theory or interdimensional hypothesis theory. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Interdimensional hypothesis in relation to UFOs in particular. He kind of postulates that the behavior is inconsistent with passenger vehicles. It's much more aligned with the autonomous type entities that have the ability to shift forms at will. And kind of come in, in and in and amongst the dimensions, I guess you could kind of say. And in this book that we've been referencing quite a bit, Strange Creatures from Time and Space, uh, Keel seems to be expanding that idea to include these inexplicable phantoms and monsters from around the world throughout history. You can tie this to UFOs, you can tie it to Bigfoot, you can tie it to these things too, these demonic dogs. It's this idea that they can materialize and dematerialize with no explanation. And a beautiful example of that is radar, right? With UFOs, right. They, they just all of a sudden just poof, there's not there anymore. And it's like, are they slipping under? Like, you know, because you can fly under the radar, but I don't think that properly explains it. And I don't no. think a lot of people would agree with that. But there's less <laughs> data for these phantom canines, but I think you can kind of draw parallels, right? Like, I think, like we've been saying it this whole episode, essentially, is the idea that these are ultra terrestrials to a certain degree. It definitely seems to be the case. The thing um, is, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, like, it's... It, the reason that question comes up is like you said off the right at the top of your little at the paragraph here, like taking the appearance of such. And that makes me wonder if these are ultra terrestrial or, you know, interdimensional, ultra dimensional, however you want to phrase it or whatever. It's like, are they are they taking a form of just something that we can interpret mm-hmm. or, or, or 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 is it literally a four legged creature that that is similar to things mm-hmm. that exist in our plane, but is different? That's an interesting point because, again, that actually ties into something I was just going to mention where it's like, are these intentional or incidental, right? Are these forms, are they up for our interpretation or are they projections that are being intentionally projected from these entities? Right. Or is it the case where it's almost like a Partridge Creek monster where it's like, these things are just doing their thing and we just happen to kind of notice them once in a while? Right. Just straight like i mean we talk time slip in that too but just straight like it's 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 happening we can see it Mm -hmm. but it's not technically in our world so to speak yeah or our sphere our our realm our our dimension sure Mm -hmm. the different (laughs) drawers it's like the yaku gears (laughs) very much so. all these different things bigfoot's in one drawer and then you've got yeah these like phantom canines in one drawer and then you've got abcs in another (laughs) ufos in another and they're all kind of co-mingling and and we just happen to kind of notice them yeah i'm or, glad you brought that up yeah because because and because because we've mentioned the whole sasquatch ufo thing and like stuff like that too because that's different it's like seeing a black dog is that's giant and has red eyes that's just a slight 
variation from what we're already familiar with. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. As opposed to like a Sasquatch or yeah. a Flatwoods monster or. Yeah. Or, or there's that, it, that familiarity to it. Interestingly, yeah. you can kind of apply the same thing to the IDH sort of theory, ideas on like the progression of what we see in the skies, right? So like the idea that they were airships back in like the early or sorry, late uh, 19th century. And then they progressively kind of like expand into different forms, right? And right. is it because the technology, some people even simplify it in terms of like, there's two dimensions. We're living in one. A lot of these things are coming from the other quote unquote dimension, which is too simple in my opinion, but, yes. and that these, this other dimension is simply 30 or 40 or 50 years ahead of us. That's kind of how they describe it. And that they have hmm. technologies that we just don't quite have yet, which kind of, we will get eventually, which will explain things eventually. And then like, you know, and then we'll see the next uh, sort of formation or, or, or uh, the, the, the articulation of right. these other beings these ultra it's very strange yeah i i always go back to that intentional or incidental sort of thing though where it's like is there intent right is there purpose to what or are we just happening like i said right we just happen to notice once in a while and it's just like these things are just in their own world <laughs> yeah like do they we notice us in, in the same way you know like <laughs> mm -hmm. are we seen by by Sasquatch in the same way as like this turned into Sasquatch episode. But mm -hmm. yeah, no, that's a really good question. Intention is such a significant factor in all this. It's like, mm -hmm. and it is the chicken and the egg yeah. and like whether or not certain people's epistemology and like what you know, what you're familiar with is like the reason for, you know, like that mm -hmm. Bradley family seeing the dog run mm -hmm. straight into the brick wall, Yeah, you know, like get a little bit more back background on them. I mean, Mm -hmm. that, like yeah i mean and they just happen to be in the right place at the right time it's not as if it was directed towards them at all and that's where you kind of get into this whole like um like human centric explanation for all this right it's like they're doing it to us they're they're kidnapping us they're they're studying us it's like we are the center of their you know no we're probably not no we're just ants yes like, we're, not, we're not interesting to them yeah. if anything they like to poke and prod us occasionally and just take one of us in their little crafts or whatever like you know what totally. i mean like and again that kind of ties into the whole like um the deflation of what i would call humanism as like the dominant ideology of our culture there we've kind of gone past that and so i think our even our discussion right now kind of reflects that right i agree a, sort of a post-human sort of a idea of it all definitely mm. i think it's worth mentioning to just wrap it up that there was a discovery of a quite large dog skeleton yeah. that did prop up the idea of this being a cryptozoological phenomena uh, and tying to the mm -hmm. beast of jevedon and other european just things like mortar, that man. right flesh and bones and it turns out that i mean you know it was purported some people oh it could be the size of a dire wolf or whatever it was about the size of a great dane big dog um, but it was buried ceremoniously. So this was a, something that was cared for. This wasn't like a, you know, a vanquished marauder that was then chucked into a ditch or something like that. It was discovered at an abbey, an ancient abbey. Mm -hmm. And so this doesn't really uh, give us much to fuel the cryptozoological argument other than the idea that like, you know, massive creature. I mean, we're still waiting to find bones of lots of different species that we don't know much about. We got a molar and a jawbone of Gigantopithe Gigantopithecus. We got mm -hmm. one arm and a skull of, you know, Homo floresiensis on, mm -hmm. on Flores, and we don't know any. We don't know anything about what else could have existed. Maybe this was a cryptozoological phenomenon at one point, mm -hmm. and we are dealing with a Partridge Creek esque time slip type thing because clearly that was a dinosaur in that story. It existed at one point. It's mm -hmm. not the same as a spectral dog per se. Yeah. So that's kind of where I'm going with that. Um, clearly, no conclusion hard no. hard line conclusion to no. the uh black shook mm -hmm. and these bizarre spectral hounds so the we want to know continues. what it, it very much does and there are modern sightings continuing to this day if you are a listener from the british isles please reach out to us we are so so interested to hear if any of your family members you know i'm sure some of you have stories from family members going back generations that have encountered something like this before so please hit us up and let us know and just let us know what you think about the episode like mm -hmm. where where are you leaning on this cryptozoological is it how are you feeling about our pronunciations <laughs> oh 
<laughs> Actually, maybe don't comment on that. Yeah, let's leave that one out. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for listening. Make sure to check out all the links at the bottom, like we mentioned off the top of the show, uh, as well as our uh, network, Straight Up Strange. And come follow us on our social media, Instagram, at Into the Portal Podcast, at Into the Portal Podcast on Facebook as well, and at Into the Portal 1, the number one on Twitter. And we're super active on there, you guys. We love chatting with all of our listeners and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So thank you again. Yes, we would like to thank our regular sponsors of the show, audible.com, betterhelp.com, all of our Patreon supporters, as well as our producer, Tim Godby. You guys are amazing. (laughs) Until next time on Into the Portal. Your gateway to the bazaar. This podcast is a part of Straight Up Strange Productions. Discover more shows like this one at straightupstrange.com.